This episode of the Virginia History Podcast is brought to you in part by James Dean, our newest Patreon subscriber. For more information about how you too can support the podcast on Patreon, please stay tuned to the end of the episode. Carry me back to I had the incredible pleasure to interview my friend Tony Williams for this third episode of the Pillars of 17th Century Virginia Society series. Tony attended Syracuse University where he earned a BA in history before securing his MA at The Ohio State University. He then taught history at Peninsula Catholic. While teaching, Tony began a writing career with his first book, Hurricane of Independence, a 2008 hit. Other books soon followed, covering early American history, such as the wonderful 2011 book Jamestown Experiment, which is this episode's inspiration. Recently, Tony published Hamilton, an American biography, a well-done quick jaunt through one of America's pivotal founders. In addition to writing books, Tony is a senior teaching fellow for the Bill of Rights Institute and contributes to both the Washington, Jefferson, and Madison Institute, as well as Constituting America. He has appeared on C-SPAN's Book TV, Bill O'Reilly's Legend and Lies, The Patriots, as well as lecturing at the Department of Education, U.S. State Department, National Park Service, NASA, and Virginia's Festival of the Book. Tony is also a favorite speaker for various history groups across the country, including a group that he and I both had a part in establishing, the George Washington Society of Virginia. A brilliant historian, Tony is the perfect person to interview concerning economics surrounding 17th century Virginia as well as how Virginia's role affected future American history. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as we did in recording it. Tony, appreciate you meeting with me. Appreciate our friendship. As uh, my listeners know, I do highly recommend your work, and I'm, I'm really excited to interview you, especially in regard to your book, Jamestown Experiment, which my listeners don't know if they haven't read it yet. Uh, they need to. Tony really focuses a lot on the entrepreneurial aspect of Jamestown uh, and the economic aspects in, in a way that most historians don't. They, they cover the events in Jamestown, but they don't show why a lot of those things matter in different settings. And an economic setting is a necessary thing to understand when we're talking about early Virginia, and then even just for the foundations of the United States. So that being the case, let's jump right in, Tony. Jamestown was initially a business venture. What, what kind of a business venture was that? Well, thanks for having me, Robert, by the way, and it, it's great to be on. But yeah, so the the Jamestown Colony was established as a joint stock company, and these were uh, prevalent, especially in in England. And the the format of of them was pretty simple. Uh, the, anyone you know who understands the stocks in in a mm-hmm. modern corporation would would understand it. If you had just have investors who pool their money to support some venture. A lot of these ventures were actually overseas adventures uh, in, the, in the hope of taking advantage of, of the world's riches, such as the, the Spanish with their massive treasure fleets of gold sure. and silver sure. coming over from, from the New World. But they were also interested in the, in the Asian trade and, and finding different routes to that trade uh, to Asia. So there were a lot of different companies established in, in England. and. And even um, the Dutch Republic had some. Mm-hmm. But investors would, would pool their money, invest, and then they would reap any profits that were made, sure. and minus usually a, a tax to, to the monarch. And, you know, in many ways, they're, they're really uniquely English. So the Dutch started some too, but the Spanish monarchy, uh, the French monarchy, these, when they sent out 
when they paid for ventures overseas, those were primarily paid for by the crown. And a lot of that came obviously with a lot of control as to the objectives and, and to the wealth that was found, etc. And so these are very much entrepreneurial. And in fact, Elizabeth would invest in them, but she was an investor as the monarch. She was just a wealthy investor who happened to be the monarch mm -hmm. rather than the, the controlling person who paid for the entire voyage. And then uh, all the glory would then redound to her as well as the profits. Right. So did the colony prosper under this type of business? Well, theoretically, it should, right? right. Theoretically. So, you know, I, I think that a little background is necessary for understanding. Right. First of all, it's part of an entire international competition with especially Catholic Spain. You know, right. Protestant uh, England was competing against Spain was competing against the, the Dutch to some extent, well, or actually to a large extent, especially later on uh, in the 1600s. But, I um, mean, they were also competing against France. What were their goals, the English, in terms of coming over to North America? Well, the Jamestown settlers had it right in their sort of founding documents, the Virginia Company, that, they, that the settlers had to look for certain things. One is they were certainly seeking a Northwest Passage. Um, every river that every European empire who came to the New World, every river they sailed down, they, they thought they had found the Northwest mm -hmm. Passage mm -hmm. and this was going to be a river through the continent that was going to take them right to Europe and they were going to reap massive rewards and profits by engaging especially in the spice trade but other commodities as well. And they're also really hoping to find gold and silver. Well, obviously, this is just the, the most valuable possible commodity you can find in the New World. The English had spent decades raiding or trying to raid mm. the, the Spanish treasure ships coming over from the New World and from Cuba. But they're also interested in other commodities. You know, that's in their, uh, in their charter as well. So... Mm -hmm. Anything of any kind of value, uh, including crops, but, but anything that they could trade, trees, pine trees for, right. for, for the Royal Navy, potash, whatever they could find was fair game. And, and the Virginia comp company wanted profit from it. And these profits would obviously go to their investors, as I said. So why do I say theoretically, to an answer your question, well, you know, in theory, it's a great entrepreneurial idea um, and it should have worked. But several things mitigated against that success. One is just the, the disease climate. The settlers were, as soon as they came over that first summer, they were suffering from typhoid, they were suffering malaria, they were drinking out of the James River and, and getting salt poisoning. So they just, they, they became lethargic. They literally couldn't work. And so I think that needs to be said. Second of all, almost from day one as well, Besides getting diseases, they were under almost constant attack from, from Native Americans. It's hard to work. It's hard to plant right. crops. It's hard to do anything when you're right. under, under siege. And they were for lengthy periods. And, and people were, were dying. And then they had to build a fort. And so they're diverting their labor. They're diverting their other natural resources towards doing that. Right. I mean, they did some exploring and so forth for the, for the commodities. But they're suffering these attacks. Thirdly, they, I guess, just decided uh, it was easier to steal corn from the Indians than it was right. to plant it. Okay. Right. So, so these three factors are important, but fundamentally, what I argue in the book is that the policies, the socialist policies, which we'll get to, I think, later in the podcast, I'll have more to say. But, you know, they're, when they first arrived, they're eating out of the common storehouse on the ships. Mm -hmm. and, you know, provisioning ships are, are on their way and would arrive soon. And there's just no private property. I mean, they're there not to work for themselves, but to work for the good of the company. Uh, and right. all the investors who are going to get rich off mm -hmm. of their hard work. So, and I'll allude to this probably several times, but the adage that, I work and you eat, <laughs> right? Is as Lincoln said it, he called it a tyrannical principle. You know, it just wasn't the proper incentive structure to to really make them work very hard when they first got here. Right. It, it's very difficult to uh, advance the project you're working on if it's not your project. 
And essentially, I mean, that's what Virginia was. It was somebody else's project. So they, there was no ownership. There was no pride in the work, which are, are key to any business. I mean, great companies today give you an ownership feeling. They make you feel part of that team. It just seems like from the reading, not just your book, but especially your book, you mentioned a number of different things. You don't get the sense of feeling that this was their land. This was their colony. And that does go a long way, as we've seen not just in Jamestown, but in other, other areas, which we, as you mentioned, we'll get to it because we're talking somewhat about socialism, which is a fundamental issue that was really woven into the fabric of founding documents for the company. Which is so ironic, right? I mean, yeah. it is an entrepreneurial expression, and there's something very uniquely English about it, and there's a lot of other individual qualities there, individualist qualities, and, and yet they have a model which just doesn't work. It's right. just bound to fail. But you mentioned, I mean, the title of your book is a Jamestown Experiment. So they were still learning a lot of these things, and it, it was an experiment early on. They do start to learn. Sadly, however, the things they learn here in Virginia, they don't learn in New England when they start Plymouth and Massachusetts <laughs> Bay. They still go through the same problems sure. a few decades later. But nonetheless, the lessons are there. They do learn from them. The experiment proves true in one way, false in another. So we've already hinted at this. What really helped to prosper the colony, as you argued in the book? Right. Well, well, many, you know, many historians are automatically go to tobacco. tobacco you know, they, they got rich. After a decade of failure, they, they started planting this brand of tobacco, had them found a market right. in, in England, and so they got rich. And so the colony took off. I said, oh, okay, that may be to some degree true. But there needs to be something more fundamental, I thought. There, there needs to be some underlying factors because... Why didn't the colony succeed for that first decade or so, from about 1607 to roughly 1617 or so, right. give or take, you know, a year or two? So you just don't have, during that, that first decade, you don't have free enterprise. You have a decade in which they were living under martial law. And, and these gentlemen could have lived freely, more freely over in England. Right. You know, right. they're, they're living under martial law. John Smith establishes some, some very tough policies. And what a lot of historians argue is that these people had too much freedom and that they needed more discipline. No. Right. Uh, you know, in fact, the exact opposite is true, that, that they just lived under the control of the company, these very strict policies. 1612 brought more martial law with, with a new set of laws under Thomas Dale. It just, it just didn't work. And... It was just constant martial law. And then suddenly in 1615, 1616, 1617, and then ultimately in 1619, when they give the settlers private property, when they give them a chance to raise the tobacco on right. their own land and keep the, the fruits of their labor, again, right. which I work and I eat, not I work and you eat. When they're finally given that opportunity to then have representative government and greater liberties and freedoms as they enjoyed under Magna Carta over in England, sure. when they had all these traditional liberties of Englishmen, then the colony took off. And, and what happened? Well, not only did they thrive economically, some people were getting fabulously rich. Uh, other people were, were working for them and, and doing well and doing better. And they started governing themselves. But what happened over, you know, from 1619 to 1624, 4,000 settlers came in only a few years, right? right. And they braved disease. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indian attacks got worse, not better. Right. Why did they come? Why did they risk sort of life and limb and, and their health and just a horrible death rate for that opportunity? You know, there's just no other explanation. Certainly. Um, and they could own their own land, which they couldn't do over in England. But it took a lot of fits and starts. 
and, and a decade of, of abysmal failure. So it wasn't just tobacco. Tobacco is sort of a symptom of everything, but it's not an underlying cause. Sure, because especially as we go through the 17th century, tobacco goes goes up and down on the market. And as it goes down, colonies and plantations in the colony start to prosper. So how does that entrepreneurial spirit develop? You mentioned already 1616, 17, 18, 19 especially. What did the colony do to go from, you mentioned Thomas Dale, his laws divine, moral and martial. What does it do to change the way they're approaching how the company and then eventually how the royal colony approaches settlers coming in, settlers settling the land, settlers getting involved in the in the free market at that point. Right. Well, I think we even actually need to go back much further, okay. um, even into the English character. Right? Sure. And I've alluded to some of these things already. Look, you know, the, the, the English system of representative government, these traditional liberties and rights under Magna Carta, you know, the American founders will refer to them 170 years later. But that spirit was well entrenched even by this point and was part of the English character. Secondly, I would argue that the spirit of, of Protestant individualism, you know, I don't want to make too much of the Protestant work ethic. I mean, that's, that's you know, it's been a huge debate historiographically uh, over the decades. But there's something just very different from, from the English economic system even than Catholic Spain and Catholic France, you know, which is much more corporate in orientation right. and much more driven by the monarchy. You know, there's something to, I think, that Protestant work ethic and spirit of capitalism, if you will, in England, in, in the Dutch Republic uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. And I think that's, that's an important factor. And I think thirdly, that there is part of a joint stock company and that entrepreneurial spirit is, is alive and well in the, in the English men who would come over here. And when they arrive, yeah, they have that decade of failure and the martial law, the common storehouse, that socialist model. But, but what works? Well, what, what works is, is land ownership. What works is the House of Burgesses, is, is living as freemen, is, is be, sort of becoming Englishmen again. And that cash crop of t tobacco is obviously very important because, you know, they had sputtered for a decade in, in terms of finding some kind of commodity or something valuable, right? The French found furs up in right. Canada and, right. and on, the, on the colonial frontier out west. Several countries found codfish up in up right. Newfoundland and New England. Puritans had a lot of arable land and, and fishing mm. and so forth up in, up in New England. And of course, the, the Spanish had gold and silver. And so and in the Caribbean, you had the, the sugar islands. Right. So each empire, each region of the New World needed to supply something valuable. Other, right. Otherwise, you know, the, these colonies were, were doomed to failure. But... I think that English model, that new model after, let's say, 1619, is really what sort of proverbially struck gold for, for the Virginia Company in Virginia. That, sure. that was really just the fundamental way forward. And at that point, you see, as you mentioned, the 4,000 settlers that come in, yep. they're looking for land. Sure, before then, they were looking for the gold and silver that the Spanish were looking for, but land became much more valuable, as we saw. That, that made Virginia really excel and they start spreading out right and, sure. and even indentured servants right sure. i mean you, you know they had no money right to come over so it's, it's a another system that works it, it pays for their passage yes their labor is owned they're not slaves but i mean life isn't that pleasant for indentured servants but um, many of them die and many of them die fit, yeah. uh, primarily of disease and, right. and and indian attacks and so forth but that disease climate is rough but they keep coming over over decades and mm. decades and decades mm -hmm. up through the 1670s. They are continuing and, and even afterwards, but continuing to come over, supplying their labor, it benefits the colony and they get not only passage, but that then that opportunity to own land. Right. I mean, that was huge. Right. And yeah, most people didn't climb up tremendously up the social ladder, but they could have a few acres, uh, you mm -hmm. know, they could plant corn, and they could start a new life for themselves. They could have that opportunity that they never would have had, even in England, right. let alone continental Europe.
what kind of a legacy did that land ownership have on Virginia? And there's a two-part question there. I mean, it's also going to have a, a legacy on future America as well, but very specifically with the private property aspect, because this is the first time, realistically speaking, in world history that non-aristocracy is owning private property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so what I argue in the James Hunt experiment and what I like to argue right now is that, you know, in Virginia, you see that ethic continue throughout the 17th and into the 18th century, you know, primarily with the planters. These planters own, for the most part, large plantations. They own the choice land. They're raising a massive amount of tobacco. Right. But there, there shapes up to be a very important tobacco trade with mm -hmm. England. Okay, something like 60 million pounds a year after several decades is being shipped to England. And, and that's a highly valuable, highly lucrative trade. And, and a whole system develops around it. So the planters send their tobacco out on these ocean-going ships, which go up to the, the Virginia rivers. They get the tobacco that's stored in these warehouses. Like I said, 50, 60 million pounds of it. They're even flooding the market with it. As, as you mentioned, the, the price goes up and down, but, but generally drives down because of supply, right? It's just right. supply and demand, it's market economics. And they're shipping it over to their factors over in England. These, these large merchants, the Scottish merchants mm -hmm. and also English merchants are, are selling the tobacco there for them. The crown is getting a tax. What these factors do is then they order all of these both necessary goods, but also a lot of fine luxuries that these uh, planters want to imitate the aristocracy over over in mm -hmm. England and and live a nice life over on the periphery of the empire, if you will. So they're importing all these luxury goods on these ships when they return. And then once they return with all these goods, then they load up their empty holds with, again, more tobacco right. and they ship them uh, over to England. So a whole system of, of trade, of ocean-going trade, of, of the Atlantic system develops around this. But the planters aren't the only ones benefiting from this trade. I mean, obviously, right. smaller farmers are part of it, poorer farmers are sure. part of it, or middling farmers on the make. Indentured servants, even, who, again, are working off their passes and buying the land, and, and some do quite well and even own other indentured servants and slaves. Mm -hmm. And some of these even include African Americans. Right. And, of course, you know, so that system develops around Virginia. Obviously, slavery is going to be a great contradiction right. to the system, right? right? It violates the system of, well, so literal self-government and right. self-ownership. Or even um, the term free trade. I mean, it's... Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an, it's an un, <laughs> unfree trade sure. um, in, in human beings, in, in human flesh. Uh, and it contradicts that entrepreneurial spirit in so many different ways, right? You don't, uh, Africans don't own their labor. They're unfree. And they never have a chance for social mobility. They never have right. a chance for freedom, right? As it becomes an inherited condition. And so within the system, you know, we can sit here and praise this entrepreneurial spirit. And I, I think properly so, as it does benefit many people. But it has its contradictions in sure. Virginia. And, and unfortunately, tragically, the labor system switches from that indentured servitude, from that system which supported free labor in the end not totally right there's there's right. a complex picture right with, with right with indentured servitude but slavery is its greatest contradiction we can see that the market lifts everybody's life out of what it was in the 16 early 1600s 1607 mm -hmm. certainly by 1640 and 1650 yeah. we're seeing better homes better technology yeah. advancement the spreading out along uh, the rivers and in the interior but you're right. As they're doing that, they can't keep up with their expansion. And that's where, where the slavery becomes a negative side effect of that. Yeah, and slavery, you know, slavery itself is just still just a very complex picture. Absolutely. In the, in the sense Absolutely. that, you know, its origins, despite the claims of a few historians, its origins are still quite murky. And, you know, where does that, the, the demand for labor versus the difference the racial difference right. or or otherwise in terms of their their pagan religions and so forth as opposed to being christian opposed to their black skin that 
is is a transformation that takes decades it does, uh, right. in, until these slavery laws in the 1670s you know a few before about in 1705 there are you know sort of more even more firm laws. right it's a murky situation at it, best. Yeah. i'm glad you mentioned yeah. it it, do, it does take decades because you see angolans coming in in the, in the 1619 mm -hmm. 1640s there are blacks that are descendants from those angolans and then there's others that are also brought we see some ownership of Africans owning other Africans, we see right. that. Then in the 1670s, when you get into Bacon's Rebellion, you do see a, a sharp change mm -hmm. in that period, essentially because most African Americans at that point, they supported Nathaniel Bacon, not Berkeley, or Bar William Barclay. So there's an issue there, and then we see it really formalized from that point on. We're talking 1619 to 1705, it's a long period of time. And, and as you mentioned, it's extremely complex. There's a lot that's going on there. You know, and, and Edmund Morgan has made sort of the, the interpretation that's still sort of reigning in American slavery, American hmm. freedom, that whites at the lower end of the social economic ladder were very happy to have slaves because they would at least be, you know, higher on the ladder now. And the argument gets complex from there. But I still actually don't see the evidence for it. I, I guess contrary to a lot of his professional historians, I, I'm just not necessarily persuaded by that. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of accepted as gospel truth, but I still don't think it really explains that shift to African labor. And and the numbers, even by the early 1700s, are still, I mean, one slave is too many, but, you know, the, the numbers are really still very low uh, by the beginning of that century. And it's really... Slavery really only takes off in, in the 18th century. What lessons can we learn about the economic aspect from Jamestown and early Virginia? Specifically, I mean, we, we've already talked about the model that the Virginia Company was using, which can't really use the term socialism because I guess right. the formalized ideas of socialism really don't come until the 19th century. But nonetheless, whether the formalized pen on paper ideas are there or not, it's still very similar. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty Marxian, right? right. Uh, it's an anachronistic term, admittedly. But what doesn't work? Or, you know, what lessons can we learn? Well, we can learn that the colony does not thrive under martial law. Right. <laughs> right. Not surprisingly. Uh, we learned that in Sparta, you would think. That's right. It, it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't thrive when there's no private property, right? And right. Another lesson from there. Uh, it, it doesn't thrive when people are forced to work. Or there's a common storehouse that says, well... If you keep sending ships over with supplies, why should I bother planting corn? I'll just get free food every few months when, mm -hmm. when, when the supplies arrive. There's no incentive structure, right? So if you want to talk about an incentive structure for hard work, for entrepreneurship, for people having private property, for, for them to work hard, you really need that private property. It's really, really fundamental because then they can start planting corn that feeds them because that's the ultimate way to tell people if you don't work, you're not going to eat like John right. Smith tried to. Just stop giving them free food and, and give them land. Let them buy land and, and let them eat what they raise and, and let them then decide whether how much tobacco or corn they want to raise respectively. Right. And they get to choose what they feel is benefiting them the best. Yeah, how much food am I going right. to raise to eat? Or can I plant tobacco, just tobacco, and then trade that for corn? Or mm. can I ship it and, and to England and then get money and then buy my the, the necessities that I need right. uh, to survive? I mean, that's how you then develop specialized labor, you know, but the individual is choosing. Right. Uh, not the company, right. not some leader, not, not right. some royal governor that's Sunday. They can look at the market and say, hey, yeah. the price for corn is higher than soybeans this year. Why don't I plant more corn? Right. Uh, which, as you know, and some of my listeners know I'm a farmer, we deal with that all the time. Right. Sure. We've got farmers calling us up saying, hey, what's, what's the market today? Go ahead and sell my soybeans. 
Uh, they're waiting for that proper price to benefit them the best. Right. Uh, and it helps them, but it also helps us as the, the purchaser of that commodity. And then we, we sell that and we make a profit as well. But it helps everybody out in, in line. And then it also feeds a massive quantity of people somewhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's a good point. I mean, what effect does this have on America broadly, on the American colonies? Well, I mean, you know, each region starts to specialize, right? right? You know, you have primarily tobacco from, from the mid-Atlantic and... Uh, Virginia, Maryland, South Carolina raises a lot of rice and indigo and, mm -hmm. and, and other crops. The model is very different up in New England. I mean, right. they have mostly free labor. They have small farms, small yeoman farms that they kind of scrabble out in existence. Right. But they all they also fish and and very send much. commodities like like pine trees over over to England. The you know, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. I mean, they're they're on farms too, but they're, they're part of a lot of ports and they're part of this international trade and, mm -hmm. and they have that thriving specialization of labor. I mean, there are artisans of, of different levels of success. There are farmers out on the, the Pennsylvania frontier who are doing very well. Um, a lot of merchants who are sure. part of that international trade and in commodities. So, so, so there's a lot of regional differences and, and that's okay. And I think that they all in, in their own way contribute to the, eventually this sort of ethos of, mm. of free enterprise mm. in, in the American system. Now that free enterprise ironically is thriving within a, a system of mercantilism, right? Which is distinctly an unfree trade, right? Right. right. Uh, everything is running through in theory, running through London. It's right. to London's benefit, you know, the colonies exist for the good of, right. of the mother country. And there are a lot of trade regulations, right? right? And a lot of trade restrictions. And, and yeah, the, the Americans break those trade restrictions and they're smuggling and, and right. so forth. Or they are trading with the West Indies on their own and so forth. And even some other, other European countries. But, you know, the idea is a distinctly very anti-capitalist or anti-Adam Smith of idea. And, and the idea is because it predates Adam Smith. They, you know, they thought there was a finite amount of wealth in the world and they thought it was a zero sum game right. and, and any money going to buy imports from other countries or those other countries are exporting it. England, the Americans are importing it. If that gold and silver goes to, goes to those other countries, then they're going to win, you know, right. because that that's the, the source of wealth in the world. And, and there's a finite amount of it. What we've learned the last 200 years is that growth can, can create take more place wealth infinitely and, and right. continue to create wealth right. and have true multi-trillion dollar economies. And that absolutely comes from that specialization of labor. So for instance, you mentioned New England fishing. They developed some of the most cutting edge fishing techniques and technology in the world. Whereas in the South, they develop what comes to mind is Eli Whitney with his cotton gin, but he's not the only one. Cyrus McCormick is sure. Reaper and so on. They develop tools to farm better. It takes less human involvement, takes more machine. And today, I mean, you look at the farming equipment today, you get one guy behind a combine, he can, he can plow through a field really quickly. Whereas in the past, you would need 100 people to do that same amount of work or more. So now we're doing more we farmers have a lot more land now and they're doing all of that work with far fewer people so that specialization of labor as they're creating wealth they're creating more time to figure out how to do their job better and they just continuously streamline that which is absolutely part of that private property they got the property they can do what they need to do with their land and then their ingenuity specialization of labor all of it in a circular flow benefits themselves and then others around them. You do argue this, is that Virginia really figures a lot of that out early, which really helps Virginia to become, as we know, by the time the Union of American States comes together, by the time that comes, Virginia is the most wealthy. It's not because all the wealthy people from England came to Virginia. It's, they figured out how to do a lot of this better over a short period of time. And I think that's great. Now, under what you're mentioning with the mercantilistic idea, pre-socialism, I don't want to confuse the, ter the two terms because they're, they're definitely different. But with those regulations and that top-down approach, like let's say with the, the French crown, everything goes through the, the French crown, you do it the way they do it. Eventually that, that leads to some serious complications, not just in France, but even in the French colonies. And Virginia's different. 
The American or the English colonies are different. I mean, you mentioned all of these here. You mentioned specialization of labor, private property, free trade. It, it wasn't always perfect. I mean, they had issues. In the 1640s, you mentioned the Dutch. There are issues with the Dutch trade in, the, in Virginia. Are they allowed? Are they not allowed? We're at war. What are we going to do? They some issues there. But huge there with private property, they get all of these freedoms to choose what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it. Which, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, that sets your book apart from many of the others on Jamestown. You, you bring in this aspect of entrepreneurialism that is key. It, it's a hallmark of Virginia history that, that absolutely we cannot forget. Right, and, and it becomes a hallmark of, of American society, obviously. And, and so, but, you know, by the time of the American Revolution, we have the, the American colonists have politically largely governed themselves for 170 years and they're, th they're 3,000 miles away. They have colonial legislators based upon the model of the Virginia House of Burgesses and they have that, that political sense of self-rule. Economically, which we've been talking about the whole episode here, is that American sort of individualism economic model largely free of the regulations of Great Britain mm -hmm. They're largely taxing themselves through their colonial mm -hmm. legislators and, and making a free gift to, to the king or queen in terms of paying any taxes. But they're largely self-governing economically as well. And of course, religiously, the Great Awakening and then the Second Great Awakening, these will have a profound impact upon mm -hmm. feeding that American sense of, of individualism and, and autonomy, um, that fierce Presbyterian spirit, right. for example, right. but the other other Protestant denominations that sprang up as well. So what I argue in, in that book and, and actually my other books is that, that you know, this American system of, of self-government, of, of, of individualism, economic liberty, religious liberty, political liberty, you know, the seeds of that are sown deep within the colonial period, very early on, I would argue. True. And so, you know, that independence from Great Britain is not, yeah, there's strong debates about it during the American Revolution. And yes, you know, they retain sort of an English character and, and you know, to some degree an English identity, if you will, ties to Great Britain. But there's something also very strong in the American character as well. Absolutely. Uh, that develops during the colonial period. Once again, the book is Jamestown Experiment. I think you wrote it in 2011. Right. Is that correct? That's where, cool. where can my listeners find that book? I, I've got links to it on my show notes page, but they can find it, I'm sure, Amazon and, and yeah. elsewhere. Amazon is the easiest place to find it. Yeah. Uh, you know, your local bookstore will carry my books as well. You know, I've published six books. Your most recent one was Alexander Hamilton. Go ahead and tell us what other books you've written, a little summary of what you've done and what you're what you're what you're working on now what you will be working on right sure and you know your listeners can find me on 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 twitter and instagram on sure. facebook t williams author and i'll have links to to all yeah. of that on yeah. the show notes page as well and so they can find i won't me put your phone number email address, so. <laughs> <laughs> and my my amazon page is, is red lake accessible with all the books but yeah, so I started off publishing a book about a revolution, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, a, a hurricane that hit during the American Revolution. Right. Uh, a very interesting sort of micro history uh, called the Hurricane of Independence on the second deadliest hurricane in, in history. My next book was about a, a smallpox epidemic in which mm -hmm. the, the first inoculations were, were tried out uh, curiously by the Puritan ministers and opposed by the doctors of Boston. That was in 1721 in colonial Massachusetts. Very interesting story about the intersection of science and re religion yeah. mm -hmm. during the colonial period. My third and fourth books were, were published simultaneously, Jamestown Experiment, but then also America's Beginnings, mm -hmm. which is a, a, was a fun collection of 50 stories from, yes. from Jamestown up through the Constitutional Convention on the American colonial history and, and evolutionary and founding period as well. 
it's a fun book I did with Colonial Williamsburg, my publisher. My last two books, one was on the, with Stephen Knott at the Naval War College, a friend of mine, professor, who, and, and we published Washington and Hamilton, The Alliance That Forged America. And we argue that, that that relationship between Washington and Hamilton was really the key, the, the fundamental relationship of the founding. From the war, constitutional period, and then obviously in the new nation. And then my, my most recent book was just on Alexander Hamilton. Right. So which was as you as books. you mentioned it it's a condensed version of of the larger book by Ron Chernow because Chernow's book is what is it, eight hundred pages, nine hundred yeah, pages. Those who don't want that kind of <laughs> commitment in their lives. You know, eight or nine hundred pages. Maybe they'll finish reading it someday and and a lot have aspirations to, to finish it. Sure. But but no, I, I mean I wanted to write just a brief digestible book on Alexander Hamilton, a nice biography focusing on his American identity and and American principles and and American statesmanship. I thought that was a unique way to tell the story. But yeah, to to do so in less than 200 pages, in fewer than 200 pages in in which uh, someone could read it in a a weekend or or, or a week's time period and really understand who Alexander Hamilton was. Now, you also write, you do some articles, Bill of Rights Institute and... The Washington Jefferson Madison Institute. Thank you. You know, we, we run some some smaller teacher seminars. But, yeah, with the Bill of Rights Institute, I am a, I'm a senior fellow there. Mm-hmm. do a lot of writing and research in, in terms of the, a lot of the exciting curricula that we're producing. Mm-hmm. And then I also do various things like go around the country or do sure. podcasts and, and do webinars, primarily for teachers, uh, but also for students and citizens and on American founding principles, on civics, on American history. So, in fact, so a you just lot did an of, article. Fun work for them. You just did an article today about religious freedom. Uh, yeah. So, so, so that that's on the side. Uh, so yeah. I did that for Constituting America, right. where right. I helped Janine Turner's and civics organization, mm-hmm. and that that's an important group too. And, and sure. I'm actually fellow with them as well. And they run every year a, a 90 day. 90 essays in 90 days, and I always have a lot of fun contributing to that. That's at constitutingamerica.org, and okay. they're on social media as well. And so so I do a lot of blogging for them and for, for other groups as well. Sure. Well, I'll definitely have links to everything on the show notes page, and listeners definitely check Tony out. Very well worth your time. I can vouch for him. He's a good friend of mine. <laughs> Very much so appreciate him. I was very, very excited when I first stumbled across his book, Jamestown Experiment. I said, I have to meet this guy. So, and I actually met you at St. Luke's. You were talking right, about right. Pox and the Covenant. Right. I do a lot um, of lecturing all over the sure, country. Sure, that's, that's one of my favorite places. If you get a chance to hear one of Tony's lectures, absolutely uh, make time, go hear him. He's, he's great. Tell him I sent you. He'll appreciate that. Well, Thank thanks you. for the time and the great yeah. questions. It was a lot of fun. Talk Thank you, Tony. Thank you again for supporting the podcast. It's greatly appreciated. Please continue to spread the word and help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider, like us on Facebook, and visit the website. Sharing episodes and other work is the best way to expand the community. Another way to greatly aid the podcast is by providing feedback on iTunes. If you have yet to do so, please take a few minutes and leave us a comment. Doing so helps bring exposure in the iTunes network. It also helps me to know what I need to improve on in future episodes. If you would like to support the work financially, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. Links can be found on the website, or one can visit the campaign at patreon.com forward slash vahispod to see the choices and rewards being offered for your generosity. In addition to my personal links, please visit the websites mentioned in this episode. 
Information for Tony's work will be on the show notes page, so check it out. And please join me next time as we continue our walk through Virginia's history. Do 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 do